So, hello and welcome. Uh, this talk is about Edgerend, a uh, novel data structure for Catmull Clark subdivision surfaces. And this is joint work with Max Oberberger, Matthäus Kaidas, and Quirin Meyer. Let's dive right in. So what is Catmull Clark subdivision about? So the idea is. Ah, okay, good, fine. So the idea is that you have a coarse mesh as input, and then you subdivide it to a smooth surface um, using subdivision rules until you're satisfied with the resolution. How does it work? So the concept is based on B cubic B splines. So here we have a context of four, a grid of four by four points, and then you can evaluate the smooth surface of the centering quad using the B spline formula. Um, but what to do about these kind of configurations where you have, for example, a vertex with valence three or um, a pentagon, and here you only have the subdivision rules from Catmull Clark. Um, and the idea is that you create new control points and then just do it over and over again until you have enough points. There are three different kinds of points. So first on are, is the fa face point, which is just generated from all the vertices that make a face. Then there's the edge point, which is generated from all the points which are kind of adjacent to the edge. And then you finally update all the vertex points or the, of the input mesh um, with all the adjacent vertices. All right. And then you take your new points and connect them with quads. So the refined mesh is always a uh, quad mesh. And then you get your refined um, mesh. Okay. How to render such a surface? Um, so the most common technique rely on the observation that the directly evaluable portion of the surface increases the more you subdivide. So here you got three new patches which are cubic B splines and um, only one corner is still extraordinary. Um, other techniques rely on the observation that extraordinary vertices isolate themselves after two subdivision iterations and then STEM found some lookup tables to directly evaluate um, the surface of the extraordinary patch. Um, what we are interested in about is to directly implement the subdivision rules on the GPU in an efficient implementation. And uh, here we take the half-edge refinement by De Puy and Van Hoy from two years ago as our base. And the idea is that they take the well-known half-edge data structure and just subdivide it on the GPU in an efficient implementation. And well, um, this technique has kind of some attributes and we want to keep them, so let's write a to-do list. So we want to run fast, right? We want to uh, allow for real-time topology changes. So for example, they just take the half-edge data structure and if your, for example, modeling software already uses some kind of half-edge data structure, you're good to go. You don't need any pre-processing. Um, we want to do something similar. And um, half-edge is really easy to implement, not that much code and it is extensible um, to semi-sharp creases, for example. So we want to do that as well. Right, so let's take a closer look at the half edge. So a half edge is essentially a struct that has a reference to a vertex, um, a reference to the previous half edge and to the next half edge, some IDs, and uh, a reference to the twin half edge. And if you look at this from the perspective of a quad, you get these two-way references to all adjacent quads. And we thought this two-way reference was kind of redundant, and so let's add this to the to-do list. We want to reduce the neighborhood information, if possible. All right, so this is the core half-edge implementation. Um, so it consists of four kernels, and you can see all these kernels essentially for each half-edge do something. And you cannot merge these four loops or in that run in parallel because, for example, the edge point computation requires knowledge from the face point computation. So you need your synchronization barrier in between. And this uh, slows down the computation, so let's uh, add this to a to-do list. We want to merge everything into a single dispatch if possible. All right, next, um, here's how um, a new point is created, and this is essentially an atomic float add. So if points are floating point and you need an atomic synchronization because multiple threads add onto the same memory address. Um, and this is a special feature in most uh, APIs and also for it's not available on every hardware. And um, so we don't want to do that. And there's one more thing about it. Um, atomic floating point arithmetic is in fact not deterministic. So uh, let's take a look at this code example. So we here we define three floats. 
And if we just add them in two different ways, right, we change the brackets and we cross it to an integer and print the result, we can see that, in fact, one bit is flipped. Why is that? Well, floating point arithmetic is not associative. And if a scheduler changes the um, order of execution of threads, the resulting mesh, in case of subdivision, will also change uh, a little bit. Is this a problem? Well, you can decide. Uh, here's a visualization of that. So what we did here is um, we took two identical cubes at the exact same position, and one is blue, one is red, and if we subdivide them using atomic floating point arithmetic, here we can see the, this artifact. It's a constructed example, but uh, well, you can at least visualize it. Um, if it's a problem for you, you can decide, but we wanted our algorithm to be deterministic and not rely on special hardware features, so let's add this to our to-do list. All right, finally, um, we uh, noticed some problems with the memory layout, uh, more on that later, so let's add this on to, to our to-do list. We want to improve it. Okay, this concludes the to-do list. Let's start with the first item. We want to reduce the neighborhood information. So we talked about this. We have this two-way reference, and when we want to reduce this to a um, one-way reference, we quickly realized that we need this alternating pattern. And a different way to look at this is to say that each quad receives two edges, and the two other edges of the quad are referenced by these arrows. And um, we call these arrows the edge friends, so that's the name of the data structure. That way we get our neighborhood information. So you notice for this we need quads, and well, we know that after one subdivision iteration everything turns into quads, so we need a preprocessing iteration. Um, and we additionally want to build this alternating pattern during this um, preprocessing iteration. How do we do that? So we always start a new quad at the in original corner of the old quad. And if we do this for all the um, new quads, we can see that always the first and the third edge are owned by the quad, and the two other quads will get the edge trend. Okay, and if we do this for the neighboring quad, or for the pentagon here, you can see that this pattern always works out. By the way, if the mesh is not closed, we just close the mesh, and then just ignore the uh, unused or the redundant faces when rendering. Okay, so let's uh, show the edge friends again. Um, so we successfully reduced the neighborhood information, essentially halved it, um, so let's check that one. Okay, let's talk about how we subdivide our data structure, and essentially uh, we split our subdivision into two tasks, the vertex task and the quad task. This is the quad task, so we spawn a thread per quad, and then First, just, we just compute a phase point, pretty straightforward. And then we can use the two edge front references to compute two edge points. And if we do this for all the quads, we can see that all the edge points are computed by someone, none are missing. So again, this pattern. So this concludes the quad task, and we now have successfully computed the edge points and the phase point. Let's talk about how we update the vertex points, so we talked about this, we need to collect all the vertices that are adjacent to the vertex. And how we do that, we again use the edge friends and just start at an arbitrary phase and just loop around, uh, so to say, the valence of the vertex and collect all the data that we need in a do-while loop and end the loop when we are back at the original corner. And if we um, visualize this, you again see this alternating pattern. So we can go clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, and so on. All right, so we have successfully removed all atomic floating point arithmetic because we just gather all the information that we need for the point update in a single thread, right? So we don't need any synchronization there. But we still have two separate dispatches. We have the quad task and the vertex task. So let's talk about how we merge these. So for a mesh, we have f with f faces, we have f quad task, and with v vertices, we have v vertex tasks. And then remember this guy, and he found a ratio between the vertices, edges, and faces of, a, of in this case, closed topology homomorphic to a sphere. There's also a formula for other topo genera of topology. And we know that we have assigned two edges to each quad, so we can just plug this in and rearrange a little. 
And then we can say, well, the number of vertices is approximately equal to the number of faces. So we can just plug both in the, the same kernel and just exit early if, uh, if there's this edge case when one number is greater than the other. Well, then we're done. So let's uh, check that one. We've merged it to a single dispatch. All right, um, let's talk about the memory layout. So this is the memory layout of previous work. We have the vertex point and, and then just append the face and the edge points uh, which are newly created to the buffer or to the memory. And um, if you do this, uh, look at the next generation, we interpret this buffer as the new vertex points, and here you can see the exponential growth of the problem. Um, and we notice that a new quad will always reference one vertex point, one face point, and two edge points. So the distance between the memory addresses of the vertices that make a quad grows exponentially. And this is really bad for cache coherency. Um, what we do instead, we again remember that the number of vertices is approximately equal to the number of faces. So we just interleave the buffers and just say we put one vertex point, one face point, two edge points, and then repeat. And this had a great effect on runtime performance because the cache is more coherent. All right, so let's check that one. And let's talk about results. So here are our subdivision timings, and um, in this case for five iterations, so we multiply the number of phases by a thousand approximately. And um, our technique is in blue. The previous technique, um, half edge refinement is in orange. And the red uh, bars are the half edge refinement with um, where we had to simulate floating point arithmetic for, for example, hardware or APIs um, that don't support it. And as you can see, we are approximately three times faster than previous technique. So we wanted to run fast. We are about three times faster. Let's check that one. So um, we wanted to allow for real-time topology changes, and I mentioned that we need some preprocessing. We need one preprocessing iteration. So um, we measured our preprocessing. Uh, these measurements include the generation, like the, the input is a vertex buffer and an index buffer, and we generate a hash map for like, getting neighborhood information, and then we subdivide once into edge trend geometry. And these are our preprocessing times, and as you can see, we need less than three milliseconds, even for our biggest mesh. So uh, we call that real-time sufficient. All right. Um, finally, we want it to be easy to implement and extensible. So we successfully um, extended our technique to semi-sharp creases, what was pretty straightforward. Um, and well, easy to implement. We have basically all pseudocode in the paper, and we are aiming on publishing at least the shader in uh, open source soon. So stay tuned. So let's check that one. All right, this concludes our to-do list and my talk. Thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions. We have a question here. Hi, yeah, that's a great talk. Um, just one question. You were talking about making sure that the mesh was always closed. So does that change the, the behavior of the, the, the end surface as you mm. um, subdivide? It, it does, but we allow f uh, semi-sharp creases. So we have um, added support for semi-sharp creases, and then we just add or we just set all the edges that are actually borders as infinitely sharp, and that way it, they have the same rules, so it works out. Oh, I did, I did. It's awesome. Okay. Uh, should I stand up? Either way is fine, right? Um, I can see you. Okay, perfect. Uh, great talk. Uh, any thoughts on adaptive depth first subdivision? Yes, we thought about it. Um, don't have a solution yet. <laughs> okay. But it should actually kind of work, right? If you collect the one ring, mm -hmm. right, and then do it locally. Not sure it's if it's me Sorry. or someone else. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can pull a similar problem than like with uh, unclosed, uh, with, with open topology, like with borders, right? Um, because you need to, s like in, in our case, we only can loop around a vertex one way, and if there's like a face missing, we kind of need, uh, we're kind of missing this reference. I thought about solutions, or we thought about solutions. Um, we put it in previous, w uh, in, in future work. So okay. maybe we, we can come up with something. Okay, thank you.
So what do you think the future for Catmull Clark is versus triangulated kind of uh, approaches, just in our field in general? Um, hmm. So I mentioned, for example, like current techniques only always use the tessellation shader, and I'm like interested in about whether using mesh shaders might be better, but I can't say yet. So, but I don't have any more to say about it. I fear. It's like our speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>